Next on the Pray in Jesus Name show, Dr. Chaps will pray about these important issues. Today we conclude part four of our special four-part series on the church history of the doctrine of Christian salvation, the theological study known as soteriology. Today we compare Jonathan Edwards to Charles Finney, the Keswick and Durham versus the Holiness Pentecostals, and Zane Hodges versus John MacArthur. Former Navy Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt took a stand to defend religious freedom by daring to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Now he helps you by reporting the news, discerning the spirits, and praying the scriptures. Would you pray with us? Here's Dr. Chaps. God bless you in Jesus' name. My name is Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt, Dr. Chaps, and you're watching Pray in Jesus' Name. Today we're going to conclude our four-part teaching series on the doctrine of soteriology throughout church history, at least Western church history. We really didn't get into the Eastern Orthodox beliefs, but throughout Europe and throughout America, uh, we've studied soteriology, which is the theological study of the doctrine of eternal salvation, especially as it pertains to that salvation purchased for us by the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. You know, I don't wanna lose any of that. Jesus is our atonement. Only Jesus paid for our sins. Our sins cannot be forgiven by any other sacrifice, any other blood sacrifice that we do. What Jesus did on the cross is entirely that which God uses to forgive our sins. Now, in previous studies, we talked about the different views, you know, faith versus works, uh, Paul versus James, Luther versus the Council of Trent, Calvin versus Wesley, which all leads up to today's topic, the roots of holiness theology in the modern Pentecostal movement. Today we will discuss these three different themes. First, we're gonna compare Jonathan Edwards versus Charles Finney, both Presbyterian revivalists. We're also gonna compare the Keswick or Durham precursors to the Pentecostal movement, which favored Calvinism and free will, excuse me, against the sanctification ideas, not free will, but of the Wesleyan holiness Pentecostals, which favored free will and all that. We'll also compare toward the end, Zane Hodges and John MacArthur, who wrote two books in the 1980s about these differing views. Now, let me point out before we move on from that slide, that the people on the left of this slide, again, are the ones who favored the Pauline view of theology, that grace through faith, not by works. You see Edwards, Keswick, uh, Durham and Hodges. Uh, those are the ones who favor Pauline theology. On the right, you'll see that J Charles Finney, that the Holiness Pentecostals following John Wesley and even John MacArthur, they emphasize the James or jo Johannine view of biblical theology. They all believe the Bible. They're all good Christians, but they disagree with each other on which voices in the Bible should be emphasized in the unified choir that follows Jesus Christ. So with that introduction, let's get right on to Jonathan Edwards and Charles Finney. Here are two pictures of these men. Uh, Edwards led the first great awakening, Finney led the second great awakening. Here in America, you're gonna love the comparison when you see they're both Presbyterians, both even Calvinists in some ways, but had totally diverging views on soteriology. Uh, here are some of their similarities, right? I have a slide here that they're both ordained Presbyterian ministers that they, they were both college presidents, interestingly. Uh, Edwards was the president of Princeton, Finney was the president of Oberlin College, and they both led Great Awakening revivals that changed American history forever. Edwards, who lived from 1703 to 58, led the first Great Awakening, along with other revivalists who contributed to that. Charles Finney was a great evangelist in the 1800s, led what is now known as the Second Great Awakening, he was also very in influential to uh, abolish slavery. He actually wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln a few weeks before the Emancipation Proclamation. Charles Finney led many churches in the North to fight to free the slaves and also to admit women. Oberlin College was the first to admit blacks and women in America and give them college degrees. And Charles Finney was behind that, good for him. Well, first let's talk a little bit about their uh, Jonathan Edwards and some of their differences, right? Edwards was a Calvinist. He lived in New England, very soft-spoken, but very intellectual, brilliant, brilliant man, theologian, pastor. And he preached and wrote uh, 
sinners in the, in the hands of an angry God. That is perhaps his most famous Calvinist sermon delivered in 1741. He talked about the inability to obey God, that we're so unable to obey God, our only choice is to cry out for God's mercy. And religious affections, he also, that's another book that he wrote on what it means to truly love God. And if you read that and you can still call yourself a Christian, it's amazing because it, it's so hard to truly love God. And his style of preaching and you know about hell and destruction led people to despair inability to obey God's laws, which forced them to call upon Christ. Classic Calvinist type of sermon and very effective at leading revival. Here's a quote from an eyewitness when he preached sinners in the hands of an angry God, which is the second time he preached that same sermon. He gave it to his own congregation. They didn't like it, nothing happened. He went across the street, preached that same sermon to a different congregation, a whole revival broke out. Here's an eyewitness said, quote, before the sermon was done, there was great moaning and crying went through the whole house. What shall I do to be saved? Oh, I'm going to hell. Oh, what shall I do for Christ? And so forth. So yet the minister was obliged to desist. Ye shrieks and cry were piercing and amazing. People were crying and falling out in the church, in the aisles, overcome with emotion because they wanted to receive Christ. Perhaps that was the start of the first great awakening, or at least a, a notable contributing factor. The first great awakening in, let's say the 1730s to the 1790s was when most of America became Christian. And maybe it started with this pamphlet published by Gilbert Tennant, The Dangers of an Unconverted Ministry. And he wrote about how some Protestant ministers are not even born again, they're not Christians. And it alarmed the people, what do you mean? We're, we're all going to church, the pastor's up there preaching. He's not a Christian, how can I be saved if I'm following him? So that caused controversy. And then George Whittefield, another great Calvinist preacher, open air revivals. John Wesley did this over in England. Notice it's not dependent on the theology. Whittefield was a Calvinist, Wesley was an Arminian. They both preached to massive crowds in open air preaching, led thousands of souls to Christ. Uh, on the hillsides, massive, crowds were on the hillsides and their message was essentially the same. Over in England, here in America, you must be converted, repent and believe on Christ. So great revivals in the Presbyterian movement, great revivals in what became the Methodist movement, people came to faith in Jesus Christ through the first great awakening. And Jonathan Edwards had a, a, an enormous impact in, in that early movement. Well, let's fast forward to the 18th, excuse me, the 19th century, the 1800s, when Charles Finney came on the scene, right? He is also a Presbyterian, but he was ordained Presbyterian, but eventually he came to become an Arminian. Uh, he led what we call the Second Great Awakening. And before he was converted, he was a lawyer. And so he read Blackstone's commentaries on the law of England, which continually referred to the Bible. You know, most of the law of England was at that time based on the Bible. And so to become a lawyer and to read Blackstone's commentaries on the law, he had to get a Bible. And so he, he bought a Bible and he was amazed when he encountered Jesus Christ in his own personal born again experience. He decided to go out in the woods and said, I will not come in from the woods until I am converted. So he was determined and, and went, finally he did come in. And while he was sitting by the fireplace, he was overwhelmed with the love of God, just overwhelmed. And the baptized in the Holy Spirit described as, he said his heart overflowed with waves of liquid love. And he just wept and wept. And I think that's when God called him, not just saved his soul, but called him to be a great evangelist. And he preached like a lawyer. He was always trying to convert people, trying to persuade the people in the, in the pews like they were a jury and their soul depended on whether or not they would give a verdict for Christ. He traveled on horseback. He converted over 500,000 people in his preaching ministry without the aid of a microphone. This is in the 1800s. And this guy is the one who invented what we now see as the altar call. You know that uh, technique that some evangelists use, like Billy Graham used, right? Come forward and give your, Christ, give your life to Christ, except he would demand that they stay at the altar and continue to pray until they had confessed and repented of each and every one of their sins. 
Well, some people would be at the altar for hours and hours or days even, confessing and repenting of all of their known sins. And his message was very similar. You must be converted, repent and believe on Christ. Now, regarding soteriology, Charles Finney disagreed with Jonathan Edwards. Now they lived in two different centuries, but and, and Finney was a student of Edwards, read everything and criticized some of it. He said, quote, Edwards I revere, but his blunders I deplore, specifically with regards to the doctrine of inability to obey God. Edwards as a Calvinist said, you cannot obey God, it's impossible. But Finney said, well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, Finney followed more the lines of Aquinas, uh, is some labeled by some as semi-Pelagian because he believes in free will, the ability to obey God and human responsibility to do that. Here's a quote, he said, there's a pretended distinction between natural and moral inability, and that's nonsensical. Natural inability is an inability to do as we will or to execute our volitions. Moral inability is an inability to will. So he's criticizing Edwards saying, that's ridiculous. What do you mean you can't choose to do what is right? Of course you can choose to do what is right. Man is able to obey God, he's just unwilling to obey God. The, the reason we disobey God is not that we're unable, it's that we're unwilling to obey God. And if we'd simply change and repent, uh, then we could obey God. In fact, he preached from Ezekiel 38 and very much along the lines of William Law. He was influenced by that, that book by William Law and of course by John Wesley. Don't wait for God to convert you. Many of the Calvinists were out there, oh, you can't convert yourself. Wait, God is sovereign, God will choose you. If you're in the elect, eventually someday, God will make you repent. No, 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 no. Don't wait for God to convert you. Convert yourself. And the preaching of truth is the initiation of the Holy Spirit. He didn't deny prevenient grace, he, he, but the Holy Spirit will initiate and then you must cooperate. You're responsible to choose. He quoted Ezekiel 38, make yourself a new heart and a new spirit for why will you die? You know, that's in the Bible, that you have a responsibility to make yourself a new heart. Don't wait for God to change your heart, change your will. You change your will, you change your heart. Man's free will is responsible to cooperate with God's grace and repent immediately. Repent immediately. Don't wait till tomorrow. Come forward to the altar. We're gonna have an altar call. Stay here until you've repented. Don't go home and get hit by a truck and go to hell because you failed to immediately repent. Totally revolutionary way of preaching in the 1800s. Change your affections, love God, and you will inherit eternal life. He agreed with Luke chapter 10. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Love God and love your neighbor do this and you will live. So that's a comparison of the first great awakening, second great awakening, differing soteriologies between Edwards, who was more Calvinist and Finney, who although he was Presbyterian was more in line with the Arminian idea that the, agreed with Wesley sometimes and disagreed with Jonathan Edwards and, and Calvin. So with that in mind, let's talk about the Pentecostal movement. In, in the late 1900s, you see this pre-Pentecostal idea. Pentecostalism really didn't take off until the 1906 Azusa Street Revival. But in the late 1800s, there were two competing ideas that led up to the holiness movement, which would become the Pentecostal explosion in, in the 20th century. Before that happened, I'm gonna compare these two men on the left, William Boardman, who led the Keswick Revivals in England, and William Durham here in America in Chicago, who taught from more of a Calvinist viewpoint. And then the two men on the right, Charles Fox Parham and William Seymour, who were responsible for the outgrowth of speaking in tongues and the Azusa Street Revival, which became the holiness Pentecostal movement with entire sanctification as taught by John Wesley. So you see the Calvinist Pentecostals and the Wesleyan Pentecostals already dividing along those lines. Let's go back even further. The follower of John Wesley in the late 1700s was a man named John Fletcher. Fletcher, as I said before, wrote in defended Methodism and refuted antinomianism, wrote five checks to antinomianism. You can't be lawless. You've actually gotta love God and love your neighbor to go to heaven. If you think you can go to heaven without loving God and loving your neighbor, then you're a heretic, you're an antinomian, you're hyper-Calvinist, uh, Fletcher would say. Well, that idea was taken into this 
idea of sanctification, which was emphasized by another man, A.B. Simpson, who was the founder of the Christian uh, Missionary Alliance, right? He wrote this idea in the 1800s before Pentecostalism of the fourfold gospel, that Jesus Christ is your savior, your sanctifier, your healer, and your coming king. Notice it's not about uh, the baptism in the Holy Ghost yet, not about speaking in tongues, but savior, sanctifier, healer, and coming king. That's A.B. Simpson's fourfold gospel. Then there was Phoebe Palmer, who wrote about and influenced the, the holiness movement in the late 1800s here in America of the two crisis experiences that we should all experience. Justification, you gotta be saved, you gotta be born again, and sanctification, the idea of actually changing your behavior and being transformed into the likeness of Christ with your behavior. So those two crisis events, uh, one might happen, yeah, for me, I'll just tell you, one happened, I was born again in 13 December, 1986, and then I received the baptism in the Holy Ghost, as Phoebe Palmer called it, with a crisis sanctification event a month later in January of 1987. So there are two different crisis experiences, not to say that I haven't fallen since then or sinned and repented, I, I try to live a clean conscience, but th that's the idea, that it doesn't all come on the day that you're saved, that there's a secondary crisis event that became popular, and that's exactly what John Wesley was teaching when John Wesley himself wrote on uh, the, the crisis sanctification, following William Law and perfection and all that. So uh, let's move forward now to 1901. What happened in Azusa Street? In California, there were these guys, right? And uh, actually Charles Parham was from Kansas, but he mentored and taught William Seymour about the idea of speaking in tongues. Started in Kansas in 1901, William Seymour took that out to Azusa Street Revival in California, 1906, 1907, 1908, bam the Pentecostal explosion began at Azusa Street. These men taught about three Christian experiences. First, you gotta be born again. Then, you've gotta receive entire sanctification. That's the secondary crisis, like Phoebe Palmer said. And third, you receive the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. Literally, uh, manifestations, healing gifts, uh, the, the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit listed in 1 Corinthians 12, that's what they taught. And they were influenced by the ideas of Wesley, entire sanctification, and they began to influence what later became the holiness Pentecostal denominations. So Parham and Seymour and their idea of sanctification was included when you look at the major denominations, including these three real quick, Pentecostal holiness, perhaps the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world, the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, and the Church of God in Christ, so these three major Pentecostal denominations include the sanctification experience because their roots come from the Wesleyan holiness movement. Therefore, they believe in a five-fold gospel, not just fourfold, but they added the baptism in the Holy Ghost for power. So the five-fold gospel is, number one, you believe in Christ as your savior. He is your sanctifier who cleanses you from sin. He is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost so that you can speak in tongues. He is the healer and he is also the coming king. Notice the five-fold gospel with sanctifier is number two. That's gonna be different than the four-fold gospel that the Calvinists come up with. Let's move over to the left side, the Calvinist side of the pre-Pentecostal movements. In 1875, over in England, there was an annual conference in Keswick, England, which is you know some farmer's fields near Oxford, and they were led by a man named William Boardman. He wrote a book, The Higher Christian Life, and they would have annual conferences in Keswick for Christian revival. These were the revivalists that followed after John Wesley, but they've thought more like Calvinists, okay? One of the people attending that was Asa Mahan, who was with Charles Finney, the president of Oberlin University over in America. He was a perfectionist, but he really didn't fit in there because most of the Keswick people were not into perfection. They were not into entire sanctification. In fact, they could do without that for the most part. Two of the influential books were written by Robert Pearsall Smith, Walking in the Light, Hannah Whittall Smith, The Christian Secret of Happiness, and they criticized this idea of perfection. They said, oh, that's legalism, and because they didn't like perfection or legalism, wow, that took off. The Calvinists came out of the woodwork, oh, we love the Keswick revival, we're gonna go with, with you, and, and so these conferences became very popular. Here are the five teachings they would give along five days. 
at the Keswick Revival. They, on day one, they talk about teaching on sin and God's law. Day two, the cross and Jesus' redemption. On day three, they'd have a day of prayer and consecration, and the leaders would even joke about this. No consecration before Wednesday. Uh, day four, they talk about spirit baptism, but not a baptism for sanctification. This is just for empowerment, so you could be a powerful preacher and minister. Uh, and day five, missions and world evangelism. Well, while that was happening over in England, here in Chicago, there's a man named William Durham, who was a early Pentecostal leader, learned from men like R.A. Torrey and D.L. Moody. And again, he did not agree with Wesley, got rid of the idea of a secondary crisis sanctification event. Instead, he says, you must be born again and seek the Holy Spirit for speaking in tongues and power evangelism and healing, not for sanctification. He, he sort of left that plank out and said, let's get baptized in the Holy Ghost so we can display the gifts and win the world for Christ as good preachers. So that idea, William Durham was very influential in the growing number of non-holiness or Calvinistic Pentecostals, including these major denominations, the Assemblies of God. The Assemblies of God is a great church, but they do not emphasize sanctification as much as empowerment of the baptism of the Holy Spirit for power. Also, the Foursquare Gospel Church. Amy Semple McPherson out of California, she took the ideas, the original fourfold gospel of A.B. Simpson, and she swapped out sanctification with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so then you end up with a fourfold gospel. But there's no crisis sanctification event in the, in the version followed by Calvinist Pentecostals. Therefore, their version of the fourfold gospel is Christ is your savior. He's the baptizer in the Holy Spirit with power maybe to speak in tongues. He's the healer, he's the coming king. But notice they omitted the sanctifier. Jesus, this went from a five-fold gospel back to a four-fold gospel because they do not emphasize sanctification. Isn't that interesting how the church history and the entire view of whether or not sanctification is mandatory or optional for your justification comes out in these totally divert. I mean, how many people in the world over 800 million people in the world now claim to speak in tongues. The Pentecostal revival and in, in, into the charismatic movement that inf infiltrated many of the mainline churches, uh, Pentecostalism is very popular around the world. But there are still two divergent soteriologies in those movements. Half of them believe in sanctification, half of them don't, or at least emphasize that as mandatory for your justification. So, are you with me so far? Let's conclude by just comparing briefly these two authors, John MacArthur and Zane Hodges. Now these men are not, as far as I know, Pentecostals, uh, but they did have a debate. In the 1980s, they wrote different books, and I wanna say John MacArthur was on the Wesleyan side, Zane Hodges was on the uh, Calvinist side. John MacArthur would emphasize the scriptures in, in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and in James. No, Zane Hodges would emphasize the scriptures in Paul. He, was maybe even a hyper-Calvinist, maybe even went beyond the ideas of, of Calvinism. But here are the books that they wrote, and I'll leave these for you to pick up and read. John MacArthur wrote The Gospel According to Jesus and Faith Works, defending the idea of lordship salvation. If Jesus is not the Lord of your heart, then you're not saved. He's gotta be not just your savior, but he's gotta be Lord of your life. Make Jesus your Lord and savior today. Big, important influence by John MacArthur. Zane Hodges disagreed. He wrote the free grace idea. His title of his book is absolutely free. And honestly, I personally disagree with this book. Don't recommend it. Not because it's too Calvinist, but because it's beyond Calvinist. It's, it's into a little bit of antinomianism. Just my opinion, you might disagree. Compare anyway these two influential authors. And the book I do recommend is the one by R.C. Sproul, who is not a hyper-Calvinist. He's just a, a Calvinist reformed theologian, widely respected man. You may have heard him on the radio wrote the excellent book, Faith Alone, which defends and goes through the Council of uh, uh, Martin Luther and, and John Calvin against the Council of Trent and all that. Faith Alone is the good book that I would recommend. Talks more about the salvation by grace instead of lordship. So all that said and done, I wanna go over and just refresh in your mind what we've talked about in these four episodes. First, that although there's only one church, we all follow Jesus Christ, it seems like the church is divided along two tracks with regards to soteriology. Paul, a follower of Jesus, took one track, we're not saved by works. James took another track, we're saved by works with faith. Uh, 
and then that divided throughout the rest of church history. Augustine debated with Pelagius, one followed Paul, one followed James. Then there was the Council of Orange versus Aquinas, Martin Luther against the Council of Trent. We talked about that in episode two of this series. Get all four of these series. And we also talked in episode three about John Calvin versus Jacobus Arminius and how the Synod of Dort clarified the works of Arminius. They kind of disagreed with each other and then William Law came in with the idea of Christian perfection. And then Count Zinzendorf had a great debate with John Wesley. We talked about that in our third episode. In today's episode, we concluded talking about Jonathan Edwards versus Charles Finney, the different Pentecostal denominations, including the Keswick version versus the Holiness Wesleyan denominations. And also we finally concluded just with an introduction to Zane Hodges against John MacArthur. Let's come back to Jesus Christ. And, and we're not gonna take a commercial break here, but I just wanna reemphasize that there is one church and we all follow Jesus Christ. And what must I do to be saved? You've gotta ask yourself this question, Jesus said in Luke 10, what must I do? He was asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He, he answered, love God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, next slide, uh, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus answered him, yes, that's the right answer. Do this and you will live. You wanna start with soteriology, you've gotta love God, you've gotta love your neighbor. Do this and you will live. Would you pray with me? Let's take a moment and pray about this. Father in heaven, we give ourselves to you. And there are times in our life when we do not love you with all our whole heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. And whether it's we're saved by faith or we're saved by, by faith with our works, uh, whether there's holiness and sanctification is required. Father, we know that love is required. At least we choose to obey you with regard to your command to love. And therefore we do repent immediately and now of all of our known sins, we invite you, Father, to rule our heart. Be our Lord and Savior. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your love. And Lord Jesus, we honor you in Jesus' name. We give you our life today. Visit our website, PrayInJesusName.org. Catch all four episodes on YouTube. We'll see you next time. Chaplain Klingenschmidt is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy who earned his Ph.D. in theology from Regent University. As a former Navy chaplain, by taking a public stand for freedom of speech and religious expression, and by sacrificing his own 16-year career and million-dollar pension, he was vindicated by the U.S. Congress, who changed the law and restored freedom for military chaplains to pray in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps not only defended the Constitution, but his petitions have helped change the law in 10 states, restoring freedom to pray in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps needs your financial support to stay on the air. Would you please send your best donation today? Please visit PrayInJesusName.org to donate online. Or you can mail a check to Pray In Jesus Name Ministries, Post Office Box 77077, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80970. You can also call us toll free right now at 866-Obey-God. That's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. Please sign up for our free emails at PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org.